We are for the church and for the kingdom. This vision drives everything we do. There are many noble causes and institutions in this world, and we care about the future of seminaries, academies, governments, social causes, and parachurch ministries, but they are not fundamentally why we exist. We exist for the future of the church and the advancement of God's kingdom. With God's help, our students today will be the pastors, ministers, and missionaries of the global church tomorrow. We teach the Bible in the classroom so that generations of churches will be sturdy outposts of Christ's kingdom. This is how we serve the church, and this is how we bless every other good and noble endeavor until God's glory covers the earth like the waters cover the sea. Will you join us? Dr. Allen and uh, distinguished faculty and administration and staff and most of all students and others who are viewing, uh, thank you for this opportunity to share in this place and time with you. Uh, the title of these lectures is Just Jesus, Taking His Full Measure. And I know that the Sizemore lectures are an academic presentation, but I'm mindful that academic can imply non or anti-theological. And I'm mindful that we gather in a seminary space called chapel, and I think it would ill befit us to hit the academic bullseye by presenting talks with no connection to the worship and praise of God. Hence my topic, Jesus, just Jesus, meaning first, as primarily about him as we can make it. Surely in consideration of Christ the Lord, we may and we ought to manage to unite academics and doxology. Let us pray. Lord, pour out your grace on your people through these lectures. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus was, and as Christians believe, still is a living person. But he's also an object of human investigation. And in that sense, he is a vast topic. How do we delimit our purview? Well, my entry point is going to be an enviable book on Jesus published in 2020 called Gentle and Lowly, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers. Clearly, this is a book about Jesus. The author, Dr. Dane Ortland, is a widely published scholar whose thoughts on Jesus, even in somewhat popular dress, warrant academic consideration. Two things stand out about Gentle and Lowly. One is the attention it has garnered. Let's compare. I published the best commentary that I could on the Johannine epistles in 2008. In almost 15 years, it has attracted 56 Amazon ratings. <laughs> Nearly four ratings per year. Ortland's book, Gentle and Lowly, as of about a week ago, had 10,322 ratings in less than three years. So that's about 3,500 ratings per year, and there are actually more ratings in the last year than there were in either of the first two years. So his book beats mine by a factor of over 900 times. So let's hand it to Gentle and Lowly. It's an outstanding book with an immense impact, and since it's about Jesus, and since its robust reception can tell us something about both academic and public perceptions of Jesus, we do well to consider it in these lectures. The other thing that stands out about the book is its thesis. Jesus' heart, who he is most deeply, is gentle and lowly. He is tender, he is loving, he is accepting. Uh, that ad campaign, Jesus Gets Us, wasn't out yet, but it fits in well with the book. This has clearly struck a chord with many. In fact, Amazon still rates it number one bestseller in Christian counseling. The skillful prose of the book is arresting, and so is Ortland's command of the whole of Scripture and his artistry at biblical theological synthesis. And this is rooted in a covenant theology, which I share, and that covenant sees great, though not unqualified, continuity between the Old and New Testament writings, as well as the unity of the Old and New Testaments. And finally, I'm impressed and moved by the pastoral tone and grace that radiates from the book throughout. And I concur with the book's point in the epilogue, which is based on Jesus' appeal in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me, i.e., come to Jesus Christ. 
And I resonate with the deep truth of Ortland's closing counsel, and this is how the book ends. That place in your life where you feel most defeated, he is there. He lives there, right there. And his heart is for you. Not on the other side of it, but in that darkness. He is gentle and lowly. Your anguish is his home. Go to him. Agreed, Jesus is gentle and lowly. Just what and who we in our abject need require. Yet I wish to supplement that proposition by exploring just Jesus in the sense of 1 John 2, 1, where we read of our advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Righteous translating the Greek word dikaios, which means upright, fair, just. Ortland has highlighted Jesus as gentle, and I hope to highlight Jesus as just. We're going to explore scripture to portray a Jesus who is not only gentle but just in the second lecture of this series. For the remainder of this lecture, I want to explore the question, why is it so difficult to arrive at an agreed-on conclusion of just who Jesus was? In both academia and public discussion, people operate with vastly different portraits of Jesus. And even within the same confessional circles, people understand and proclaim Jesus in contrasting fashions. And of course, this is an age of post-confessional, diverse Jesuses, like never before. There are three domains in which understandings of Jesus are virulent and potent, shaping how large swaths of the world who hear of Jesus view him at any given time. Let us explore each of these in turn. And my argument is going to be that there are positive results found in all three domains, but the negatives outweigh the positives in two of those domains. And the third domain, which perhaps is the most profound apprehension of Jesus being found, is under-accessed by the other two. So number one, the disputed Western academic Jesus. By Western academic Jesus, I mean Jesus as he is studied, published about, and taught in universities, colleges, seminaries, and other academic settings worldwide. And there is much good news here. Just here at Midwestern, clear thinking and reverent publications on or related to Jesus by faculty have been numerous. Think of Dr. Matthew Barrett's recently acclaimed book, Simply Trinity, The Unmanipulated Father, Son, and Spirit a book aimed to help us get all three persons of the Trinity straight, including Jesus. Or take Dr. Patrick Schreiner's The Kingdom of God and the Glory of the Cross, a book connecting Jesus' humiliation to his mission and God's kingdom. Or by the same professor, the book entitled Matthew, Disciple and Scribe, the first gospel and its portrait of Jesus. This faculty has published scores of books collectively, and I'm guessing that most bear witness to Jesus directly or indirectly in an intellectually serious, but also confessionally faithful manner. This rosy picture could be expanded to dozens of academically trained specialists at accredited institutions who research and publish on Jesus in ways faithful to the biblical witness. The last two generations or so have seen an explosion in the publication of scholarship on Jesus that is academically rigorous, yet also in line with the gospel witness as well as the creedal formulations of the historic church. But I'm talking about the disputed Western academic Jesus. In the wider academic world, Jesus is not the divine human savior of historic Christian confession. And here's an indicator. A 2020 book entitled T and T. Clark Social Identity Commentary on the New Testament was reviewed by Philip F. Essler at the University of Gloucester in the UK. And after a thorough description of each chapter, Essler offers a final observation about the book under review. Most of the authors regard Jesus Christ as the primary in-group prototype, he writes. And he means he's the leading figure of the group, but still no more than an exemplary human being. Now back to quoting Essler. In relation to his suffering and death, that is accurate. But if one looks at some of the features predicated of him in 1 Timothy 3.16, such as manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, believed on in the world, taken up in glory, he was not prototypical. 
New Testament interpretation using social identity theory probably needs to pay more attention to the sort of data in the texts that would ultimately lead to the two natures doctrine of the Council of Chalcedon in 451 CE. The important point that Esler makes here with British understatement is that mainstream biblical scholarship regards as normative working hypothesis that Jesus is not the salvific figure presented by the New Testament writings. He is just the most revered human of a social movement associated with his name. This is what I mean by the disputed Western academic Jesus. Since the inception of what came to be called critical life of Jesus studies, increasing numbers of scholars adopted an agnostic or antagonistic stance toward Jesus' identity as the incarnate messianic son of God. That tendency has only increased since its rise in the late 18th century, and it enjoys hegemonic conviction today in Western scholarship. For most of church history, the Bible's verdict was affirmed that sinners are lost and need to find salvation in Christ. We are lost, not Jesus. How did the view arise that Jesus has been lost because the confessions of Scripture and the church are no longer credible? How did the church's only hope to recover some satisfactory vestige of sound recollection of Jesus become critical scholars who, based on default skepticism, set out on a quest to find Jesus as he really was in history, not as he is described in the Gospels and confessed in the church? An anthology like the standard work edited by Gregory W. Dawes called The Historical Jesus Landmarks in the Search for the Jesus of History outlines the story. Essays by 12 well-known figures are presented. Get that, 12. A sort of enlightenment mentality apostolate. Of the 12, 11 held views that make taking Jesus' full measure difficult and perhaps impossible. Baruch Spinoza, Hermann Samuel Reimerus, David Friedrich Strauss, Albert Richel, William Vreda, Ernst Trulch, Johannes Weiss, Albert Schweitzer, Rudolf Boltmann, Karl Barth, and Ernst Kesemann. The Judas in the group is the outlier who affirmed the biblical gospel, Martin Kaler. Characteristic of the 11, for all their differences, is the devaluation of Scripture as the definitive witness to Christ's full measure. Even Karl Barth falls short here, as Matthew Barrett has observed, and I quote, Barth divorces Christ, the divine and perfect word, from the human, fallible, in Barth's view, scriptures, which only become the word if and when God chooses to appropriate them, unquote. For all the differences between the 11 who have done so much to set the pace for defining the Western academic Jesus, they share a common starting point with the first of their number, Baruch Spinoza, 1632 to 1677. He was excommunicated at age 24 from his Amsterdam synagogue for de denying scripture's divine character, in the words of Spinoza specialist Mark Zapperstein. In Life of Jesus Studies, as Gregory Dawes points out, just as in the history of New Testament research, according to William Baird, and in the history of Old Testament studies, according to Rudolf Smend, Spinoza is a founding father. He denied Scripture's divine origin, along with the miracles to which the Gospels attest. No wonder Spinoza and the academic line of research he viewed as pioneering have bequeathed to the world a disputed Jesus. They are united fundamentally in their rejection of the creedal Jesus. They are compared with each other. There is very little agreement on the alternate Jesus they set forth. As someone has said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Martin Kaler stands apart in this gallery. First, writing in 1892, he states, it is quite unwarranted to demand the significance of Christ be measured by what he means to those whose devotion to Christ has all but ceased. In other words, Kaler doesn't endorse the skeptical hegemony of the Spinozan line, but considers this heritage a poor guide for taking the full measure of Jesus. Its Christological capacity is deficient or lacking altogether. Second, Kaler calls 
not for dismantling of, but deference to the canonical scriptures. Rather than a Jesus arrived at under critical rules of engaging the gospels, Kaler states, and I quote, the restraint and sobriety of the first witnesses, i.e. the gospels, should remain the criterion for the message of the Protestant preacher. We should attempt to do only one thing in our pulpits, namely to present to our hearers those old, often heard, quote, outdated stories, just as they stand, yet freshly, and as if heard for the first time. Each listener should receive an indelible impression of what these accounts mean for him. If we immerse ourselves in our Gospels and consider them from every angle, there will be no danger of monotony, unless by monotony one means the repetition of the one keynote, which indeed is unavoidable, This is, after all, the obligation and the final aim of every Protestant preacher, Philippians 1.18. Well, you'll remember, Paul says, only in every way Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. Kaler, therefore, confronts the so-called historical Jesus quest with objections to, number one, its commitment to what B.B. Warfield called Christless Christianity, And two, it's skepticism regarding what Kaler calls the first witnesses, the four Gospels as we read them, without critical deconstruction. In the wake of Kaler, the 20th century saw a chaotic series of failed attempts to come to terms with Jesus. Beginning in the 1920s, the towering figure of Rudolf Bultmann, who died in 1976, spread a skeptical view of the Gospels and the near irrelevance of the earthly Jesus for reconstructing the theology of the New Testament writers. In the English-speaking world in 1977, leading theologians published a book called The Myth of God Incarnate, rejecting John's Gospel's claims about the Incarnation, many of these were clerics in the Church of England, and calling for radical reformulation or abandonment of the doctrine of the Incarnation. This sparked a debate, but also gave impetus to a non credal view of Jesus that remains normative today for many. In the 1990s and into this century, a group called the Jesus Seminar captured the news with scholars determining that very few of the gospel sayings actually came from Jesus. In the Lord's Prayer, you could be sure of the words, Our Father. And this remains a common conviction among biblical and religious specialists. Beginning around 1980, something called the third quest of historical Jesus arose. Though Colin Brown has pointed out, and I quote, there is reason to think that the notion of three quests owes more to the entrepreneurial spirit of British publishers than to scholars actually engaged in Jesus studies. The hallmark of this quest was a new regard for the Jewishness of Jesus. This was a definite upgrade from models prevalent at that time But in prominent Western academic circles, the effect was to multiply claims of who Jesus was. It did not result in affirmation of the divine human figure fulfilling Old Testament prophecies affirmed in the Gospels. As Dr. Andreas Kirstenberger has pointed out in lectures delivered here at Midwestern, most scholars cannot bring themselves even to affirm the apostolic authorship of John's gospel, despite excellent arguments for its eyewitness basis. As Kirstenberger states, critical scholarship has been increasingly biased against traditional authorship of the gospels and the New Testament letters as part of a reaction against the established church and an antipathy toward taking scripture at face value, unquote. This concurs with a programmatic statement in the newly published book, The Jesus Handbook, And I quote, contemporary Jesus research is based on the methodological presuppositions of critical historiography, which are at the same time the basis for the relationship of history and faith in the modern era. For over 200 years, European and North American Protestant centers of higher learning have increasingly tended to reject the Jesus of Scripture, the truth of Scripture, and accordingly the figure of Jesus whom the Scriptures present. This correlates with a decline in Western churches that have turned away from scriptural authority and a Christ of creedal stature. Various polls attest to the rise of dramatically higher numbers 
of nuns, N-O-N-E-S, and lower percentages of adults even identifying as Christians. But we in the West need to own the damage done to world Christian witness and trust in the Bible through the European and North American academic assault on his memory and lordship, which has made him a disputed figure rather than a savior to worship and serve. Western scholarship, pioneered primarily under Protestant auspices, has guided Protestant churches to the point that barely 10% of the world's Protestants are found in North America. About 18% of the world's Protestants are found in Latin America. About another 18% are found in Asia. And in Africa, where Western academic authority can take the least credit, we will find about 44% of the world's Protestants at this hour. No wonder in our setting that the question of just who Jesus is is so disputed. There's much more to say, I have to move on, but I refer you for further study to the magnificent new two-volume magnum opus by the late Colin Brown called A History of the Quests for the Historical Jesus. Very different kind of an analysis of what I've just been talking about. With its substantial recasting of this history, and it is from a confessional Christian point of view, And with the rise of non-Western Christian scholarship internationally, we may hope for more fruitful questing in the near future. Number two, the diluted North American churchianity, Jesus. We continue with our question, why is it so difficult to arrive at an agreed-on conclusion of just who Jesus was? In In the academic domain, there are many sound evangelical voices, but they are a marginalized minority. And the trend in academic interpretation is and has long been away from the Jesus historically confessed in the church. But what about in the churches? We limit ourselves to the North American scene because an international summary lies beyond our purview, there being about 47,300 denominations in the world and 4.2 million congregations according to the Center for the Study of Global Christianity at Gordon-Conwell. Even limiting our look to North America, we can only generalize. Two things can be said. Number one, there are signs of health and vitality. And number two, a large percentage of people on church membership roles do not reflect a sufficient knowledge of and commitment to Jesus. Signs of health and vitality are numerous. There are seminaries like Midwestern that are growing. And I've already pointed to strong indicators in evangelical Publishing on Jesus. The online journal Thamelios attests to a vigorous academic and pastoral exchange, directly and positively affecting ministry. Numerous denominations and independent churches can point to strong churches and ministries. Even under COVID-19, and I'm quoting a study from the Hartford Institute for Religion Research, even under COVID-19, The 80% of congregations offering hybrid worship experienced an overall growth of 4.5%. Excuse me. Anecdotally speaking, many of us in church leadership or theological education are linked with colleagues and institutions that witness to a robust ongoing work of the Lord in bringing people to faith and upholding our lives and ministries in his name across North America and indeed worldwide. Uh, The Asbury uh, awakening would be a a recent indicator of this, and we are grateful. And in places where knowledge of God in Christ is flourishing, we can surmise that there is faithful witness to Christ and representation of Christ. The book Gentle and Lowly attests to a scholar and a pastor, Dane Ortland, his church in Naperville, Illinois, connected with dozens of other Chicagoland churches, and a confessional denomination, the PCA, where just as in the SBC and other biblically grounded denominations, sound answers are being offered to the question of Jesus' identity. But all is not well in Zion, and we should not be at ease. I read the Missouri Baptist Convention paper, The Pathway. In recent years, declining baptisms in the SBC have caused concern. Do I get an amen there? 
sort of. Across the U.S. and Canada, numbers of Christians relative to the larger population are falling. The Pew Research Center says that the percentage of U.S. adults who even claim to pray daily fell from 58% in 2007 to 45% in 2021. Those who seldom or never pray nearly doubled from 18% to 32%. Jesus said people ought always to pray and not to lose heart. Trends in North America show that Jesus is widely ignored. Knowledge of Jesus is not apt to be steady and strong in such a climate. The editor of the journal Christian Century recently denied the sovereignty of God. And then when he was questioned, he doubled down by scoffing at God's omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence, and by denying that Jesus' death was willed by God. This man is also a pastor. But Christian Century represents a mainline Protestantism that today numbers perhaps just 10% of the U.S. population, down from around 50% 70 years ago. Perhaps this indicates where such views of God and Jesus lead. Perhaps we should look to more Bible-believing churches for better understanding of who Jesus was and is. My sense of the knowledge of Jesus, even in such U.S. churches, resonates, I have to confess, with the claims of Midwestern graduate Dean and Sarah found in his book, The Unsaved Christian, Reaching Cultural Christianity with the Gospel, 2019. The picture he paints suggests, as I've already stated, that a large percentage of people on church membership roles do not reflect a disciple-level relationship with the Jesus they profess to follow by virtue of their church membership. To put it bluntly, and Sarah argues that lots of Christians are unsaved. He identifies eight patterns of nominal belief. Ostensible faith in Christ, but actually loyalty in name only. Here are in Sarah's eight false faith syndromes. I leave it to you to imagine how each misconstrues Jesus Adding to the complexity is the likelihood that some people probably belong in more than one group. So, number one, the country club Christian. Number two, the Christmas and Easter Christian. Number three, the God and country Christian. Number four, the liberal social justice Christian. Number five, the moralistic therapeutic deist. Number six, the generational Catholic. Number seven, the mainline Protestant. And number eight, the Bible Belt Christian. I was reading a commentary last week on 2 Corinthians that's in press at the moment. And the pastor who wrote it speaks of false portrayals of Jesus at Corinth faced by Paul. And he compares them to false portrayals to Jesus that the church faces today. And the author, whose name is, his name is Trent Casto, speaks of the socialist Jesus, the nationalist Jesus, the prosperity Jesus, and the progressive Jesus. In sum, while this term is variously defined, I call churchianity the beliefs and actions of people with some claim to Christian identity, but who lack a personal presence of the true risen Jesus Christ in their lives. Scripture speaks of those having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. This may describe half or more of the Christians on church membership roles in the U.S., since typically that many or more are truant from services and other church involvement most Sundays of the year. Like academia disputes Jesus, churchianity dilutes Jesus. His name is familiar in the lives of many, but serving him through a local gospel-proclaiming church is not a priority. In this respect, many are like the drug addict depicted in a song by the late 20th century Southern rock band, The Black Crows entitled, She Talks to Angels, and I quote, She keeps a lock of hair in her pocket. She wears a cross around her neck. Yes, the hair is from a little boy, and the cross from someone she has not met. Well, not yet. Number three, Jesus to the martyrs. The question before us is, why is it so difficult to arrive at an agreed-on conclusion of just who Jesus was? There's a third group that probably knows better than either of the groups just surveyed. Those who are dying daily in his name. The U.S. is 
currently divided between some who decry citizens killed by police and others who decry police killed by perps. This phenomenon, either way, is appalling and lamentable. But what do we make of the number of fellow Christians who forfeit their life for their Lord day by day? Though they're largely ignored by the mainstream media, the Center for the Study of Global Christianity puts their number at about 90,000 per year, which is 247 per day on average. Quite a few just in the time of this chapel meeting. Not every person would be, deni- would be dying in a state of vibrant personal faith, but many and perhaps most in their final earthly hours surely sense a summons like that of Jesus to the church at Smyrna. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for 10 days, you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. I believe the knowledge of Jesus among this group is rich. Could we but access it? We can't, because they're dead and with the Lord. Yet I mention it here as a topic for future research and for all of our prayerful contemplation. It should shock us into remembrance of how high the stakes are worldwide right now when Jesus' question is posed, Who do you say that I am? A recent foray worth digesting is the book by Martin Mosebach, just called The 21. And it's a book that explores the February 2015 incident when ISIS militants beheaded 21 orange-clad Coptic Christian men on a Libyan beach. My students turned in essays on this book just last Friday, and they were deeply moved. Today's torrent of martyrs' blood makes the dithering impasses of academicians seem callous and willfully oblivious to the wider world. It makes the vain appeals to Jesus' name and churchianity seem cheap and scandalous. Just Jesus. Who was he and how may we more fully affirm him now? That's going to be the more direct focus of our second lecture. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you are a God of mercy, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And we thank you that you have sent the Lord Jesus as a light to this world. We pray for his light in our lives. We pray for his light in our churches. We pray for his light in this benighted world. And we thank you for your hand and call on our lives to take this word to the world, and to be faithful, even as our Lord Jesus said, unto death. We pray for those this morning who are facing dire straits in the name of Jesus, and we pray that our own movements in your direction would be worthy of you who call us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.